Hello, this is Patrick Ash, author, musician, and an elder millennial with the angst to go with it. And this is my video blog. For those of you who follow me, you know I often talk about Enneagram and this feud that happened about a year ago on and off uh, about how I'm, I am hashtag not a four, I'm a faker and all that. Um, but I feel like I usually don't have that many real life examples and today I do. Um, so let me get into that. It just happened in the past couple hours. As you can see, I am dressed rather preppy and I don't like to dress preppy, but you know, when you're in the working world, trying to do things that are ultimately more important to you um, than such superficial things, then you might dress preppy because you're doing, you know, uh, work you believe in. One of so many examples uh, is I work in social services and um, I had the opportunity and the, in an after hours uh, moment um, to assist uh, refugees this past uh, August. Um, it was just a small thing, but I was like, okay, this is kind of connecting with um, something that's happening in the world right now. And I believe in this work and I believe in doing that. So that's it. Um, and so that's just the context of the background of what happened today. Um, as far as Enneagram and not a, and not a four goes, uh, one of the expressions I've heard often in Enneagram is that a four often projects um, their sense that of how wounded and different they feel, um, and that's the this video is that. All right, I, I urge those listening, especially if they're not a fan of of me and they think I'm a liar or whatever. Um, to consider that that this video and what I'm saying is the actual substance and that me dressing preppy because sometimes you have to do that for work is superficial nonsense, it doesn't matter, okay? Okay, so, so we'll focus on the substance, please. All right, so how, do, how am I expressing how wounded and different I feel? Okay, I'm gonna talk about the current conflict, uh, the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, back in February uh, 24, uh, 4th, when Putin invaded um, Ukraine, I immediately said that it was, I, on this one I agreed with the consensus, it was wrong, and he should be fought and overcome, and it was, uh, uh, what I said to my spouse was, I think the best situation is that people within his own government and country would rise up and depose him. Um, because of that, that egregious of, of an offense, and that would be the best outcome. So just bear that in mind when I bring up how someone accuses me of being pro-Putin, okay? All right, so that was my sense at the very beginning, and as the conflict has gone on and on and on, and of course, uh, Ukrainians have fought back quite courageously, uh, and at the same time, I've, I often said of, of any conflict, as, as the saying goes, you know, and war the first casualty is the truth, that yes, it was wrong, unquestionably, period. Like the best outcome is for Putin to go home, for all, for for him to withdraw the forces, many of whom are there against their will. I've seen that for sure in the, in the mobilization. Um, like that's, that's the best possible outcome. But of course, that's not happening. What do we do about it? Uh, what we have in the U.S., of course, is what we usually do, which is the neocons and in our defense department and administration, spanning presidencies, uh, going back to certainly Bush and actually the interventionist goes back many more administrations. Like they've never seen a war they didn't like, where, whether it was justified or not. Uh, Eisenhower, of course, who himself was Supreme Allied Commander, who became our, um, our uh, president, in his farewell address, he warned of the military industrial complex. And that, you know, much like Smedley Butler once said um, um, around World War I, was that war is a racket. Um, and so I think you can sim simultaneously hold the idea that a war may or may not be justified on moral and ethical grounds. And that we should be cautious of the of the military industrial complex because Eisenhower himself said it. And I think people, whether we have similar philosophy to him or not, I mean, he was like a conservative Republican. Um, 
But anyway, um, it's like of, of all people to say that. Anyway, so, and I come from a military family. Um, my father was a Marine who served in the Vietnam War in a combat role um, and had battlefield promotions. If you read my books, I allude to that, at least in Autumn Queen Protocol. Um, my grandfather was 101st Airborne, and he was at uh, the Battle of the Bulge in, in Bastogne um, towards the end of, of, um, of the fight. Um, so fought and killed Nazis. And he was of about half of his heritage was German. So, you know, make of that what, whatever you will. Uh, but he, you know, 101st Airborne. Um, so that's, that's some of my background. And when my, when my father went and fought in Vietnam and saw his, uh, saw his friends get, you know, uh, killed and maimed in horrible, horrific ways. And there was an account a journalist took of this. I'm not going to name it because I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if I want to go there. Um, but I could. May I be struck dead if I'm lying. Um, but when he came back, he protested the war. And in this account from this journalist, uh, talks about how that was not welcome among friends and family and at his university, he joined a fraternity. And of course that was like, no, we support our troops and we love America. Of course we support our boys efforts in Vietnam. Um, and my father, it's like he, he still went to anti-war uh, protests and it was frowned upon and, and he ex experienced being ostracized because of his views. And of course I am proud of my father because he did what he thought was right. When he said, you know, my friends are signing up, I'm going to enlist, and then later determined, no, this is wrong, I'm going to uh, come back to the States and protest the war. Um, anyway, I bring all this up because as the Ukraine, the Russian invasion, Putin's invasion of Ukraine has proceeded, um, and we see that the military industrial complex is profiting my perspective, like many in an anti-establishment position, people like Kyle Kalinsky, Breaking Points, you know, a lot of these outlets, um, I have often agreed with him, not 100%, but often that it's, um, we, sh we shouldn't, um, in, in, uh, we need to balance both our, our military policy in a way that is putting Ukrainian lives um, and, and, and how do I say this? I'm being inarticulate and I suck at editing. Um, but in a way that is supportive of Ukraine at the same time, not escalating the conflict. That what can we do to both support them without getting involved into a outright military conflict with Russia up to and including a nuclear exchange, which undoubtedly there is no scenario in which that does not escalate into a full nuclear war, which by any estimate, um, look up, um, um, who was, it? um, he was the secretary of defense under Clinton, um, William, um, shoot, I'm forgetting his last name, but, um, he, he was, um, he's an expert on, on, on nuclear warfare and, and the real threat that it poses, and that's not an abstract, it's not like this, you know, totally unlikely scenario that you only see in science fiction films. Um, just look up his writings on it. He has a great uh, TED Talk on it. Um, and the, you know, uh, the Atomic Scientists. And, um, I mean, honestly, uh, anyone who's written and studied it seriously, um, they're probably the first to say, hey, neoconservatives, Take, rein it in a bit because all these wars of, uh, of regime change and interventionism, when it leads to this, it's a serious problem. Anyway, um, so my point, like some of these other commentators, but not exactly because I'm, I'm you know, try to be intellectually honest with myself, um, is that you know, we should be wary of the military industrial complex and how, and should not be playing nuclear brinksmanship um, as we are currently. Um, and that you can both support Ukraine's effort through material, through intelligence, 
uh, through refugee placement, as I myself have personally participated, um, while saying we're not going to participate in, in nuclear brinksmanship, um, we will put forth, and so I posted on social media, which hardly ever gets a response, like my books, like the, like here, like I hardly ever get a response, and then someone jumps out to say, you're fucking evil and terrible and awful and I need to take you down. How wounded and different I feel, Enneagram people. Um, and this particular, so m what my post was, was saying that we can both say, like, we should have a serious proposal of peace. A serious proposal of peace. Understanding full well that Putin may have, will probably not have any interest in it, but at least we put forward a serious proposal, which could say, all right, on what, what terms, what are your, what are your terms? What, like, come to the table, let's have an agreement. Let's have a discussion. Um, Kennedy and Khrushchev's Famously, during the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis, spoke to each other. Not saying that cures all our ails, and of course, any peace agreement will not be perfect to any side by any means, especially in, in this situation. Um, but to at least come to the table, that's it. Saying, we want to have a discussion that will undoubtedly not be to anyone's liking, but it's in the name of brokering a peace especially with talk of nuclear exchange. It's just, it, that is pure insanity. And that's talking about making what is already a terrible situation exponentially worse. So my post was, what, because I've seen this, there was an op-ed in, in the Atlantic uh, a week or so ago. Um, like, let, yeah, I think it was Friday, which was, those, what was it? Those speaking of peace deals uh, are emboldening Putin and therefore are, I'm, I'm trying to be fair to the argument, even though it's preposterous to me. And so therefore is pro-Putin and therefore it's fascist. That if you are to say, we should have a serious discussion of a peace proposal, none of that saying give Putin what he wants or, or abandon Ukraine. No, absolutely not. None of that. Like, how is saying we should have peace talks? Just just, just, just come to the table of this diplomacy because we aren't. We are not doing what our forefathers did, what Kennedy did, what, you know, um, the what our policy was in 40s and 50s, which was to start with diplomacy. We are saying, no, the military industrial complex wants to... Uh, uh, um, throw billions of dollars into this conflict. So we're going to do that and have no communication. And we're saying, hold on. Can we both support Ukraine and have negotiations? And they say, no, by even bringing that up, you are therefore uh, guilty of capitulation. You're, ch ch I was called a, um, a chamber, chamber, you know, Neville Chamberlain uh, thinker, which if you don't know it, he was the, the UK prime minister that, um, you know, engaged in appeasement of Hitler saying basically whatever Hitler wants, Hitler gets because we won't want more. It's like, no, that's not what I'm arguing. You can say, I want to come to the table of peace and have that, have that negotiation say, well, no, we're not willing to do X, Y, and Z, but okay, we'll give, we'll, we'll, we're willing to compromise. If you're willing to put on the table that you'll remove, um, remove your, I mean, have the negotiation. None of it will be perfect. It never is. That's, that's what compromise is. Um, but by even bringing that up, you are therefore pro-Putin, which is just, log it's just a fallacy. Um, I don't know how else to put it. It's a complete logical fallacy. I mean, and then to have the gall in this article in the Atlantic to say that, that the anti-war faction is intellectually bankrupt. It's like, I think that's, as I often say, don't point a finger and have three pointing back at you. Because you're saying either you completely 100% agree with the military industrial complex and just escalate, escalate, escalate. Whatever Putin threatens, threaten, threaten more. And if you don't agree with it, you're a fascist. And, 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 and then have the gall to say disagreement is intellectual bankruptcy. Anyway, um, 
like the, the modest proposal here is that we should at least put is it, to say we are willing to meet to discuss terms. That's it. We we don't have to we only have to agree to any specific like having no conditions to say like we're willing to to broker a peace and to keep coming back to the table. And so somehow doing the engaging in diplomacy that Kennedy and others did is means you support you're you're not a patriot you support um you know the the Russian oligarch whatever anyway so I posted this and I had a formerly close friend from uh, from my college days someone who was against the Iraq War. Remember back with the Iraq war when Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction? And if you said, I don't think invading Iraq is the right thing to do, then you must support Saddam Hussein. And if and like no one else supports Saddam Hussein, oh, then I guess you don't care that he gasses his own people. Saying, so, you no, know, I think that's terrible too. I just don't think this is the way to do it. I don't think this war is the answer. Um but people said that you were pro Saddam, and that same accusation of you, you're like Neville Chamberlain. You, you just want to appease uh, Saddam Hussein the way Ch uh, Chamberlain wanted to appease Hitler. And you're like, no, I don't think that's the correct answer either. You can say Saddam Hussein is a terrible person, and that we want to uh, negotiate. I, don't know. I mean, we had a, if you recall back then, we had a few like very, very small um i mean it's like colin powell and a handful of others would like try to negotiate but no it was it was obvious in retrospect that they, the neocons were dead set on having a war in iraq so and today it, like you can both say that putin is wrong the blame is on him he never should have gone in the best thing to do would be for his own people to oppose him you can say all these things and how does that make you and I say this, and this person had a slew of insults of straw man saying, if you're like Neville Chamberlain and you, um, you're you pro-Putin, you don't care, you must not care that there are Ukrainian children being killed and that Ukrainian families are being displaced, even if I've personally helped, helped refugees here in the U.S., um, that anything short of a complete 100% agreement with the military industrial complex means you support Putin. And I'm like, this is a person again who was against the Iraq war. And we, we were once good friends and, and, and like kind of came up together in a, in, in anti-interventionism and uh, respect for human rights. And, and, and now it's if you don't a hundred percent agree with our with um with an escalatory foreign policy, then you are therefore pro Putin. You support Putin's government. You think the Russians are right and that they should take any country uh, uh, in Europe that they want. It's like he's going to keep marching. You're okay with him taking over Poland and the Baltic states. And I'm like, if he takes if he steps foot into a NATO country, that invokes Article Five. And that means we are now officially, not just unofficially or in a proxy war, we're officially at war. Um, and then it's like, all hell breaks loose. God help us all. Um, like, yes, the situation is horrible, but just because a situation is horrible does not mean it, can be, it can't be far worse. So some of us are saying, yes, we can take this situation seriously, the humanitarian crisis seriously, and saying, we don't want further escalation. That's why we want to be serious about brokering peace. Like in the ethics and just war theory, defense is absolutely um, ethically, uh, it's not just acceptable, it is, it is um, required. Um, and so, but somehow, and so I'm saying, and so I'm saying, yes, I, I fully 100% agree. Like, like, if I'm a Ukrainian, then I would I would absolutely support armed resistance. And if I was Russian, 
I would avoid the mobilization. I'd want to get out of the country. Um, how is any of that pro-Putin? Like, like to me, this is like double speak. If you, it's like that. Unless you agree with us a hundred percent, then you are. I mean, it's black and white thinking. And I just, I'm just aghast at this person that can understand nuance and that we used to have these nuanced conversations has decided no. You either agree a hundred percent, or you you're with, like you're with us or you're with the terrorists, like Bush once said. God, I'm I'm just astonished. I'm astonished. He was a person that, in my political up, uh, you know, upbringing, helped me realize you know the folly of like the, um, the neoconservatives and their interventionist wars and their um you know the the Bush doctrine, of um of um of you know, so-called, what, what, what is it, um, of, pr pr uh, what is it, you know, pr I'm sorry, I'm, um, foggy brain, whatever, um, pr uh, striking first, essentially, um, and he's, like, using the same rationale and the, um, pathos-based arguments that I, that we heard then, um, and so, I've lost yet another friend by the mere fact of thinking for myself. Again, for those of you who um, are into the Enneagram. But for all I know, this means to, the, to those, it's going to be like, well, see, obviously he's a six. Only sixes and attachment types talk about politics. Which is funny because the person who accused me of that is talks about leftist politics and how they're, they don't agree with neoliberals. And it's like, well, we might actually have a few things in common, but anyway. Um, and on the political front, people saying one side or the other, black and white, either you're, you know, pro-Ukraine or pro-Russia, and that's it. No nuance, no proposals of peace. If you even if you even utter it, then you then you are supporting Putin, and you're therefore a fascist. So, all right. Um, wounded and different. I have no political home. I never have. And neither my belief or religious beliefs. Um, I simply try to think for myself. But like I said, in my debut novel, Upon This Pale Hill, links below, like anyone ever does that, but whatever. I do all this marketing shit because people say that's best practice and then people accuse me of being fake and I don't sell any books and people ignore me and round and round we go. But there is a, there is a theme <coughs> in this book and that is to think for yourself means being by yourself. That's what happens and of course, in evolutionary psychology and social psychology, we know what happens is that you're you are ostracized from from um, other people, and you're left completely alone. And your you know ape brain tells you that must mean I'm worthless. That must mean I am nothing but a weight on others, because um, I can. As I can say in so many ways in my personal life, I don't have much to offer. I try to compensate with that, with a, with a different perspective. What I hope will break people out of black and white thinking, out of us and them, and that every disagreement, every political issue is us and them, to say, why can't we evolve? Why can't we do better? <laughs> I'm sure that sounds pretentious or something, whatever. Um, in thinking that a, a better world is possible and that it's not black and white. It's not one side or the other. And you can even say one side and the vast majority of this issue is correct. However, we're trying to broker peace. How much longer will this conflict go? How much higher will it escalate? We want to have that negotiation. If even having that negotiation makes you 
you know, an apologist or a Neville Chamberlain or whatever, I would say words have lost their meaning. Like many other conflicts, I'm not going to get into others, but like other conflicts where you're saying it's really terrible that innocent people have died in this conflict. I wish there was a way we could we could have a negotiation there. And they say, nope, nope, nope. That means that you're on a, that you hate the other side and you don't care if their innocence die as well. It's like, no, I don't want any innocent blood to be shed. The, and anyway, to even breathe, uh, you know, the language of human rights. Um, and this person's words, this person who I considered a good friend, um, he, he, said, he said to get the dick out of your mouth, which is, you know, homophobic on top of, um, you know, also the things that I didn't think this person would use such language, but whatever. Oh, well, the disappointments, you know, keep amounting. I guess, I don't know, you be the judge. Am I expressing how wounded and different I feel? I don't have any political, um, that if I think for myself that, I don't know, maybe any grim people, I'm a social subtype. A four, that's a social subtype. Like my adversary's book says, does his chapter on Social force, like, yes, all that, all that you said there, but whatever, I guess, guess words lose meaning with, but with that person, with, uh, the person I argued with this evening, uh, I guess it just doesn't much matter. I guess I'm not going to be heard. I'm, uh, it's going to be straw man. It's going to be, it's going to be contorted into something else that it's not. I won't be heard. I'll either be ignored or made out to be something that I'm not. Um, like my father, when he, he came back and protested the war and they said he didn't support America. Oh, well, he stood for principle. I can hope to do the same. That's it. Thank you.